There is a long history of coups overthrowing democratically elected left-wing governments in Latin America. Anyone who knows the basic modern history of Latin America knows that the U.S. government has supported many of those coups. But in Latin America, things are changing, and pretty quickly. And we see that this December 7th, 2022, there was a coup that overthrew the elected president of Peru, Pedro Castillo. And actually, basically, the majority of countries in Latin America have rebelled against this coup, which is being supported by the U.S. government. And many countries in the region, including most of the most populated, most populous countries in the region, have condemned the coup and have continued standing with the elected Peruvian president, Pedro Castillo. I actually made a graph showing the countries in the region that are supporting Peru's president going against this U.S. coup, this U.S.-backed coup. Now, if you look at the graph, which I will, in the, in the description below, I will link to all of the sources that I cite today. You can see that the governments of Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, Colombia, Honduras, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, and numerous Caribbean nations, including Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Antigua and Barbuda, um, St. Lucia, St. Lucia, many countries in the Caribbean and about half of, more than half of the countries in Latin America have publicly opposed this coup backed by the U.S. and Peru and have publicly expressed support for the democratically elected president, Pedro Castillo. Now, in terms of the most populous countries in Latin America, this is even more significant. This is a graph showing the most populous countries in Latin America. Now, Brazil is the largest country. So Brazil still has, until January 1st, 2023, a far-right government led by Jair Bolsonaro, who's very pro-U.S., and he has expressed support for the coup in Peru against the left-wing president, Pedro Castillo. But if you look at the subsequent countries, the most populous countries in the region, most of them support Pedro Castillo, including Mexico, which is the second most populous country, the third most populous country, Colombia, the fourth most populous country, Argentina, the fifth most populous country in Latin America is Peru, the sixth most, sixth most is Venezuela. So among the six largest countries in Latin America, excluding Brazil, all of the other ones support Pedro Castillo. This is an example of a significant historic rebellion against a U.S.-backed coup. Now, I have a separate video and podcast discussing how the U.S. ambassador in Peru is a CIA veteran. And as people often joke, not so jokingly, as they often say, there's no such thing as a former CIA agent. The current U.S. Ambassador in Peru, Lisa Kenna, worked for the CIA. She also worked for the Pentagon and was involved in operations in Iraq and other countries in West Asia. She worked for CIA Director turned Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. So people can go check out my separate video and podcast about that and the very shady CIA links to the coup in Peru. But I also want to look at some of the statements made by the unelected coup regime in Peru. This is a tweet from the presidency of Peru, the official account, and it shows the unelected coup leader, Dina Boluarte, boasting that on December 16th, she had a phone call with the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, who reassured, who reiterated the support of the U.S. government for the coup regime in Peru. And this was also confirmed in a statement published by the U.S. State Department on December 18th. And it's a very, and this is also, by the way, I should point out, this is very strange diplomatically. Usually, if the State Department releases a, these, these are the readout, this is the readout, right, or the minutes of a meeting. Usually, if the State Department publishes the readout, after the Secretary of State has a discussion with the foreign minister of another country or foreign leader, 
they publish the readout immediately after the call, either the same day or a day after, right? It's very strange to have a readout that is published two days after the call. So there was, there was a delay. But anyway, the point is that in this statement that is attributable to the spokesman for the State Department, who is also a CIA veteran, Ned Price, and don't forget what they say about CIA, uh, CIA former CIA agents never really being former. Anyway, so the CIA agent turned State Department spokesperson, Ned Price, said that U.S. Secretary of State Blinken spoke on December 16th with the newly appointed Peruvian, Peruvian president, Dina Boluarte. They don't mention uh, that there was a coup against the elected president, Pedro Castillo. They don't mention that Dina Boluarte has never won a single vote in a presidential election. They don't mention that Dina Boluarte's coup regime has killed two dozen protesters in the, in the days since the coup against Pedro Castillo on December 7th. They don't mention the hundreds of protesters that have been wounded. They don't mention the fact that this U.S.-backed coup regime suspended civil liberties in Peru and imposed a state of national emergency. And according to Peru's own human rights, official human rights watchdog, which is technically autonomous from the government, they admitted that the Peruvian coup regime of this U.S.-backed leader, Dina Boluarte, has sent out the military to flood the streets of Peru to attack protesters. That's why at least 25 protesters have died. And these are, of course, largely indigenous descent, poor and working class protesters. And they don't mention that. And the human rights watchdog in Peru admitted that the Peruvian coup regime is using heavily armed police and military who are, who are in helicopters shooting protesters with live ammunition and tear gas bombs from out of helicopters. So the U.S. government, the State Department doesn't mention any of that. The brutal, violent repression of these protests against the coup in Peru. Instead, the State Department says, Secretary Blinken encouraged Peru's institutions and civil authorities to redouble their efforts to make needed reforms and safeguard democratic stability. There is no democracy right now in Peru. The government is unelected. It is a coup regime. The United States looks forward to working closely with President Boluarte on shared goals and values related to democracy, human rights, security, anti-corruption, and economic prosperity. So they talk about democracy and human rights. Well, the coup regime backed by the U.S. is literally killing, massacring protesters. Secretary Blinken stressed the need for all Peruvian actors to engage in constructive dialogue to ease political tent divisions and focus on reconciliation. This is just pablum. It's typical. The, the it's a typical boilerplate example of the PR words, the buzzwords that you would hear from these kind of diplomatic statements. No acknowledgement of the fact that the coup regime overthrew the democratically elected president Pedro Castillo in a congressional coup by a Congress in Peru that in September had a 7% approval rating that is controlled by completely corrupt, anti-democratic, unpopular right-wing oligarchs who recently were exposed in the so-called Mamani Video scandal, scandal in which they were bribing other members, the right-wing members of Congress were bribing other members of Congress to vote with them for or against impeaching presidents to have what they call presidential vacancy, which is according to Article 113 of the Peruvian Constitution, it allows the unicameral Congress to have a congressional coup against the democratically elected government. And this Congress has no legitimacy in Peru. That's why the coup regime has deployed the military, as you can see here in this image, showing huge numbers of troops flooding the streets to kill protesters. And meanwhile, while these protesters are being killed, the Peruvian coup regime is boasting on Twitter, posting photos meeting with the CIA agent turned U.S. ambassador Lisa Kenna. So why are people, why are so many thousands and thousands of Peruvians flooding the streets protesting? They have three main demands. One, the release of President Pedro Castillo, the elected president who has been imprisoned for 18 months on so-called preventative prison charges without a real trial, 
without due process. This is, this is a complete dictatorial process. The other demand is new elections as soon as possible. And then the most important demand is that millions of Peruvians are demanding a new constitution to replace the anti-democratic constitution created by the right-wing, far-right dictatorship of Alberto Fujimori, a fascist dictator who destroyed all democratic institutions in Peru and created a new constitution without real democratic support. And that is the constitution that was inherited. That's why the Congress, the unpopular, corrupt, oligarch-controlled Congress can keep launching these coups against elected, democratically elected presidents. So I, I've talked about this before, but what I want to talk about in the rest of my analysis today is how Latin America is rebelling against this U.S.-backed coup. And this is absolutely historic. So this map that I made shows that more than half of the region, including most of the most populous countries in the region, excluding Brazil, have been supporting Pedro Castillo and opposing the coup. Now, I'm going to start with an incredible statement that was released jointly by the governments of Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, and Colombia. Again, these are the second, third, and fourth most populous countries in Latin America. And they released a joint statement together, and they said that Pedro Castillo is a victim of anti-democratic harassment. So I'm just going to go through some of the main points of this. You can see here, this is the official statement published by the Foreign Ministry of Argentina. And what they said is they, quote, express their profound concern for the recent events that resulted in the removal and detention of Jose Pedro Castillo Ter Terrones, the president of the Republic of Peru. For the world, it is not news that President Castillo Terrones, since the day of his election, was victim of anti-democratic harassment. They pointed out that President Castillo, and by the way, they referred to him as President Castillo, President Castillo, which is a clear acknowledgement that they still are recognizing him as the, the constitutional president of Peru. They noted that Castillo has been subjected to, quote, uh, to, to illegal, quote, judicial treatment, and they were referring to lawfare, that is judicial wa warfare, by the opposition that is politicized. And they say, quote, our governments call on all actors involved in the previous process to prioritize the citizens' will that was expressed at the ballot box. That means recognize that Castillo is the constitutional president. If you read these statements sometimes from foreign ministries, you have to like be able to get through the diplomaties, the diplomatic ease, right? Like the language used by diplomats, which is often very subtle. But if you read it, if you read through the, you know, read through the kind of subtlety, you can see clearly this is them expressing support clearly for Pedro Castillo. They said, quote, we urge those who make up the, the institutions to refrain from reversing the popular will expressed by the free vote. Again, expressing support for Castillo. And then they also say, we request that the authorities, we request that the authorities fully respect the human rights of President Pedro Castillo and that he is guaranteed legal protection. Now, individually, the presidents of Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, and Colombia have expressed support for Castillo and condemned the coup. The left-wing president of Mexico, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, and of course, Mexico is the second most populous country in Latin America. On the day of the coup on December 7th, he immediately condemned it, and López Obrador, the, the Mexican president, said, quote, We consider it terrible that because of the interests of economic and political elites, since the beginning of the legitimate presidency of Pedro Castillo, an environment of confrontation and hostility was maintained against him, leading him to take decisions that have served his adversaries to remove him. And of course, AMLO, the Mexican president, was referring to uh, Castillo's attempt to dissolve the corrupt, unpopular, anti-democratic Congress, which was trying to launch a coup against him by citing Article 134 of Peru's constitution, which allows the Peruvian president to dissolve the Congress in cases of obstructionism. Furthermore, Colombia's first ever left-wing president, Gustavo Petro, has condemned the, what he calls a parliamentary coup in Peru. And he said, Pedro Castillo, for being a teacher from La Sierra, 
which is the, the mountainous rural region in the Andes, which is where Pedro Castillo is from. He was cornered from the first day. Uh, Petro, the Colombian president, wrote, he recalled when he visited P uh, Peru on, on a presidential trip, he said, quote, when I met Pedro Castillo, they, he's talking about the right-wing opposition, were trying to break into the presidential palace to detain his wife and his daughter. He received me distressed. A parliamentary coup was already being developed against him. Now, Petro's use of that term parliamentary coup is important because this is the same language that he repeated in an interview that another interview that was published on December 17th in which he spoke more in depth about the coup against Pedro Castillo. And I'm going to read part of this interview. Um, I have a separate video that I translated that I'm posting on my YouTube channel, but the audio is in Spanish. And because a lot of people also listen to this as a podcast, not only watch it in English, I want to just be able to have English here. So I'm going to read some of the main points of this uh, interview that the Colum again, this is Colombia's first ever left wing president, democratically elected, his name is Gustavo, Gustavo Petro. And these are the comments that he made in the interview. Uh, he said, in Peru, there is an emergency with protests above all in the Andes Mountains, which is who voted for him, Castillo, because for a long time, Peru has had a social fracture between what Lima is and what the Andes is with very difficult political processes. But here, that president, Castillo, elected by the people, is from the Andes. And they overthrow him, among other reasons, because he is from the Andes, because he is poor. And of course, uh, Pedro Castillo is a farmer and a teacher from a rural area. The reason he became well known in Peru is because he led a teacher strike. And then he campaigned for president, and no one thought he, was, he would win, but he actually won with the support of poor and working class Peruvians, largely indigenous people. So then Gustavo Petro continues in the interview and he says, you have a president who was elected by the people who tries to use an article of their constitution, which yes, allows the closure of the Congress. We don't have that, but they do. And he's talking about article 134. And then this right wing Colombian journalist, Vicky Davila, who is the head of the major conservative media outlet Semana, Revista Semana, she continues in the interview and she says, well, what happened is there were circumstances, just let me say to you, there was the circumstance in which they were about to order presidential vacancy. And Gustavo Petro said vacancy, which is a parliamentary coup. So that's him referring to it as a coup. And then this Colombian right-wing journalist says, so he is a victim, Mr. President, you feel that way. And Gustavo Petro says, yes, I feel that way. So he's acknowledging that, that Castillo, the Peruvian president, is a victim of a, of a parliamentary coup. The right-wing journalist says, that statement has led to criticisms of you. Do you know that? You don't care? And then Petro, he responds and he says that this is a coup. And he said that the coup regime is now killing people. There are deaths, a state of emergency. A, pre a president elected by the people who was not sentenced by any judge and his own security and police capture him and they imprison him. Where was the legal sentence by a judge? And then the, the right wing journalist Vicky Davila says, but the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is an arm of the Organization of American States, the OAS, which is controlled by the U.S. government and backs coups around Latin America. In fact, the OAS is joining the U.S. in backing this coup in Peru. So this right-wing journalist points out Vicky Davila. She says, but the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights did not protect, protect him, referring to Castillo. And Petro said, well, is the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights being consistent today with the American Convention on Human Rights, or is it in a political game involving the OAS? Because if left-wing governments keep winning elections, the OAS has to change. And what mechanism is easier for overthrowing left-wing governments, which were legitimately elected by the people? And then here's the real money quote in this, in this interview. This Colombian journalist asks Petro, do you think what is happening to Castillo is a warning for other left-wing governments? And Petro says, for all of them. He says, this is a warning for left-wing governments in the region. And the journalist says, does that include you? And Petro says, yes, all of them. She says, do you think this could happen to you? Could they try to do a coup against you? 
And Petro res responds and he refers to recent coups against democratically elected presidents in Latin America. He said, it happened in, in Paraguay in 2012. It happened in Honduras in 2009. It happened in Brazil in 2016 when they took out Zilma Rousseff. It happened in Bolivia in 2019. He says, Petro says, the message is clear. When they can't win at the ballot box, they are trying to overthrow. That is what happened with Salvador Allende in Chile in 1973. When they overthrow Allende, who was a president who was elected by the people, when they overthrow him by force, what followed in Latin America? Dictatorships followed, millions of people exiled, revolutionary wars, of which I was a child in Central America, in Colombia. The democratic pact was broken. There was nothing but violence. Now years have passed. Now once again, the people are electing their leaders for better or for worse, but it is the people electing their leaders. Why are they overthrowing them? Because the Latin American oligarchy doesn't want progressivism. So win the elections then. Don't overthrow presidents by force. Because all this is doing is leading to levels of violence that can be very serious. If we are not able to respond, you are already seeing it. So that, those are very powerful comments from the new left-wing president of Colombia, the first ever left-wing president of Colombia, Gustavo Petro, condemning the coup as a parliamentary coup in Peru, expressing support for the elected left-wing president, Pedro Castillo, and criticizing the the long history of right-wing coups in Latin America, pointing out that it has led to violence and dictatorships. He points out that he says he was himself a child of the revolutionary wars in the region, acknowledging the fact that, that Gustavo Petro was actually involved in a revolutionary socialist militia called the M19 movement, the 19th of April movement, which was a socialist anti-imperialist militia. So he's acknowledging this history of US-backed coups and right-wing dictatorships in Latin America. And I mean, this is absolutely incredible when you also consider once again that we see the majority of countries in Latin America, including all of the most populous countries, excluding Brazil, have been publicly supporting Castillo and condemning this US-backed coup. This is an absolutely historic development. And I think really the last time we've seen Latin America r rebel against a US-backed coup like this was in 2012 after a US-backed right-wing congressional coup against the elected president of Paraguay, Fernando Lugo. And at that moment in 2012, most governments in Latin America had left-wing leaders, left-wing presidents. And similarly today, most governments in Latin America once again have left-wing leaders. So this is a, a historic act of rebellion against a US-backed right-wing coup in Latin America, which of course has happened dozens of times. And this is really one of the first times in history where the region has rebelled against it. Now, I'm gonna go back to the statements also made by Bolivia's president, Luis Arce, and also Bolivia's former president, Evo Morales, who was overthrown in a US-backed coup in 2019, because both of these Bolivian leaders have also condemned the US-backed coup in Peru. On the day of the coup, Arce tweeted, quote, since the beginning, the Peruvian right tried to overthrow the government that was democratically elected by the people, by the humble classes that seek more inclusion and social justice. We regret what has occurred in the sisterly Republic of Peru, where we send our solidarity. He added, the constant harassment by anti-democratic elites against progressive, popular, and legitimate governments should be condemned by everyone. And there were even more forceful comments made by Bolivia's former president, Evo Morales, who was overthrown in a US-backed far-right coup in 2019, a violent coup. Evo Morales said that the coup in Peru shows, quote, once again, that the Peruvian oligarchy and the US empire do not accept that leaders who are union organizers and indigenous rise to government to work for the people. He said that the political crisis in Peru, quote, was provoked by the permanent conspiring of the Fujimorista right wing and right wing media outlets against a government elected at the ballot box whose unforgivable crime was representing the poorest people. <laughs>
And Morales has, has tweeted a lot about this, condemning the coup. He has a lot of very powerful words. He also said that, quote, the congressional coup by the right wing in Peru calls us to have a deep reflection. A government elected by the people never should abandon its ideological base or distance itself from its militancy, militancy thinking that the right wing will accept presidents from popular movements is the worst historical error. And then he continued saying, in the November 2019 coup, humble people confronted the armed repression of the coup plotters in Bolivia. In the congressional coup in Peru, humble people are confronted by the repression of the coup plotting right wing. The Patria Grande, which is the movement seeking Latin American regional integration, demands justice for our massacred brothers. So he's accusing the coup regime of, of a massacre, of killing dozens of protesters in Peru. And he shared a photo of an indigenous woman protesting the coup in Peru on the left and an indigenous woman protesting the coup in Bolivia in 2019 on the right. And then Evo Morales continued and he, he tweeted, quote, we join the shout that defenders of life and human rights are making, demanding a stop to the massacres of our indigenous brothers in Peru, that they respect their vote in a democracy that represents them. No government whose hands are stained with the blood of the people is legitimate. So those are very powerful statements. I should also mention that since then, Evo Morales, the former president of Bolivia, has officially called on the United Nations to take action against the coup regime in Peru because it's killed 25 protesters at least. Now, Honduras has also expressed support for Pedro Castillo in Peru. Now, Honduras had a US-backed right-wing military coup in 2009 that overthrew a democratically elected left-wing president, Manuel Zelaya, and Honduras was governed by undemocratic coup regimes corrupt right-wing coup regimes from 2009 until the end of 2021. And they finally restored democracy with the election of left-wing president Samara Castro, who's also the first ever female president of Honduras. And her government has condemned the coup in Peru. Honduras's foreign ministry published a very powerful statement. It was actually immediately the day after the coup on December 8th, while the State Department was publishing statements supporting the coup, the Honduran foreign ministry communicated its, quote, energetic condemnation of the coup d'etat that occurred in Peru, which is the result of a series of events to erode democracy and the sovereign will of the people represented by President Pedro Castillo. And they said the government of Honduras hopes that the democratic order and electoral sovereignty of Peru retake the rule of law and guarantee its rights amid this grave constitutional violation. Coup d'etat should not be carried out, it said. And similarly, the former president of Honduras, Mao Salaya, who is the husband of the current president, Samara Castro, he was overthrown in the US-backed coup in 2009. He also condemned the coup in Peru. And by the way, Mao Salaya has created an organization that's called the International sorry, the Anti-Imperialist International of the Peoples. And the Anti-Imperialist International has actually launched a campaign demanding freedom for Pedro Castillo, who once again was imprisoned for 18 months in so-called preventative prison without an actual real trial, without due process. So I also mentioned that there are other countries in Latin America that have opposed the coup and supported express support for Pedro Castillo. That includes the countries that represent the Bolivarian Alliance. This is a leftist economic and political alliance created by Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and Fidel Castro in Cuba back in 2004. And members of the ALBA, the Bolivarian Alliance, <laughs> include Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, and numerous Caribbean nations. And the ALBA, the Bolivarian Alliance, held their 18th annual summit in Cuba, and they released a joint statement that is very powerful. They met on December 14th, and the countries that were represented at this summit include Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, and then the, the Caribbean nations of Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica, Granada, St. Kitts and Nevis, 
St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and St. Lucia. And you can see a photo of the meeting and also a photo of the leaders, including Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega, including Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, Cuban President Miguel Diaz-Canel, Bolivian President uh, Luis Arce, and the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Grenadines, Grenadines um, Ralph Gonsalves. So if you, if you go to the statement they, they published, it's a very powerful statement. The ALBA calls for the defense of national sovereignty without any foreign interference, and they say, quote, we reject the colonialist and interfering postulates of the Monroe Doctrine used to justify destabilizing and interventionist practices in Latin America and the Caribbean. And in terms of Peru, they had a lengthy statement, and I'm going to read it in full here that I translated. And you can find this at multipolarista.com. I will link to all of this in the description below. Quote, we express our solidarity with the brotherly per Peruvian people that has been subjected to a continuous institutional crisis resulting in a series of events that threaten the stability and welfare of the majority. We reject the political trap created by the right-wing forces of that country against the constitutional president Pedro Castillo, forcing him to take measures that were later used by his adversaries in parliament to oust him from office. We repudiate the repression by the law enforcement agencies against the Peruvian people who are defending a government democratically elected at the polls, and we call for dialogue, understanding, and maturity of all political and social actors of the Republic of Peru, as well as we raise our voices to guarantee the fundamental rights of this brotherly people. And they said in their statement, the alliance declares that it, or sorry, they said that they reject, quote, these destabilizing plans and actions fueled by powerful external factors and national oligarchies that have managed or are attempting to disregard the will of the Latin American and Caribbean peoples, which has been democratically and legitimately expressed at the polls. They also condemned the lawfare in Argentina against the former president and vice president Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, and they condemned lawfare, calling them politically motivated and legally unsubstantiated judicial processes as part of unconventional warfare strategies against democratically elected governments. And by the way, they called for reparations for slavery in the Caribbean. They called for solidarity with Haiti and support for the negotiations in Colombia. So those are a lot of powerful statements from countries in Latin America rebelling against a U.S.-backed right-wing coup in Latin America. This is a historic. This is absolutely historic. And the map I made here shows these countries that have publicly come out against the coup, including, once again, Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, Colombia, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, and numerous Caribbean nations representing the largest countries in the region, excluding Brazil. And when Lula da Silva comes to power in Brazil on January 1st, we'll see what his statements will be as well. But this is a historic shift in Latin America, and it shows that the 200-year-old Monroe Doctrine, which celebrates its 200th anniversary next year, 2023, going back to 1823, this colonialist doctrine, which the U.S. government under Donald Trump repeatedly invoked to refer to Latin America as their supposed backyard. Or Joe Biden, he referred to Latin America as the U.S. front yard. But it shows this colonialist mentality in which the U.S. empire sees Latin America as its colonial property. That is, is dying. As Latin America unites, as the left is on the rise in the region, and as they try to take back their country from foreign imperialists and foreign corporations. And we see them opposing a right-wing coup, a historic development, I, as always, will be reporting on these kinds of historic developments. I'm Ben Norton. If you want to support the work I do, you can go to patreon.com slash multipolarista. I appreciate any support that you can provide. I don't have any big donors or sponsors. And I will be back very soon with lots more analysis and re original reporting. See you next time. Thanks a lot.